Greetings, Roger here. Luke's still taking a break. Uh, right, I wanted to talk about Sonic Boom, the TV show now. I haven't made any real official statements about it yet, besides a couple jokes. Now, at first I wasn't planning on talking about it. If I talk about Sonic Boom, the TV show, I have to talk about the comics and the other cartoons, and that's opening a giant can of worms. Regardless, Sonic Boom has such a huge impact on the games now, not to mention uh, there, there isn't much of an alternative to Sonic Boom. So let's talk. Besides, I recently had a bit of a realization about this show. Okay, first, for the record, as a Sonic comedy, I think this is a huge improvement over the Pontev games. The characters are a lot more sympathetic, more pleasant, there's more variation in style, more physical humor, and occasionally there's jokes I really like a lot. In particular, I like the translation machine jokes, some physical humor jokes, and an amusing aside from Eggman here and there. The narrative flows better, good jokes in the show, I, I do chuckle quite a bit here and there, and that's a lot more than I can say about the Pontav humor. I did have a few issues with the show, but recently I'm looking at it a little differently, so my problems are irrelevant for this video, so I'll ignore them for now. A Sonic Boom the TV show is actually more sophisticated than I expected, or at least more different. I needed to look at it from a different perspective. Uh, okay, before I get to my point, let's observe an episode as an example first. About what Sonic Boom is trying to do. Uh, I think. There's an episode here, Eggman and Flood. In it, Eggman tries to kill Sonic, and Sonic and friends use his technology against him for a prank. And as a result, Eggman decides to stop using technology forever and go back to basics. Now, from a writer's perspective, this show does something very interesting. You have Sonic and Eggman, the eternal enemies, hero versus technology-based villain, so an episode about Eggman rejecting technology and trying to fight Sonic in a more natural way would be very interesting. How would an Eggman fight or deal with plans of world domination without his greatest skills? So hey, Looney Tunes Antic comments. Instead, the show doesn't go into that direction at all. Well, there is a very brief payoff where Eggman ineffectively tries to attack Sonic with a useless weapon, but most of the episode is more about Eggman running around shopping or doing farming instead. And then, the show does something very interesting again, when the action picks up at the last third of the episode. Instead of going for the Eggman fighting with natural resources route, instead it's more about the town's goofball villains overtaking his lab. And the episode now puts Eggman in the protagonist role, where he's suddenly a lot more heroic, or at least more protagonist kind of character. So as an audience, we're invited to be with him, to sympathize and recognize ourselves with Eggman, instead of looking at him passively as the expected comical villain like he would be in the past. Exploring him as a human being instead of as the world-dominating bad guy Eggman. This is one example, but one that is a very prominent element in the Sonic Boom TV show. This made me remember an idea I was already toying with in my head before, but now I'm really convinced that Sonic Boom, the TV show, is not really about Sonic the character, it's more about us, the audience. Sonic Boom is doing something very clever, where the characters are reshuffled and rearranged, that they more or less resemble attitudes and behavior we see in ourselves, or like to see in ourselves, and merely uses the expected and established Sonic mythos, the robots, the speed, the fighting, the romance, all the elements from the original series, and just uses that only to emphasize the character's behavior or worldview, rather than really using it to tell stories about that. It's a really clever thing. Okay, so obviously story characters are always made to be recognizable human, of course. They're always based on us, to some extent. Uh, but say the big difference between like an Eggman or Sonic from the original series or here in Boom is that the foundation and motivation of the characters is deliberately made more vague and implied making the characters less anchored and railed onto the narrative. Like in the other series, Eggman's desire for world domination is a very prominent and relevant part of his character. It's what he's about, it's what drives all his actions, it's what his stories are all about. His ego, his respect for his grandfather and science, and his dreams of creating his own land is what drives and grounds the character. Everything about him is about world domination. Which makes the character very limited for a comedy show like Sonic Boom's trying to do. Everything that happens to him or what drives him must in some way be traced back to his core character foundation. He's tied, even trapped inside his being. Sonic Boom Eggman, on the other hand, cleverly makes itself more loose and versatile. Sure, the world domination is still around, but it takes a much different grip on the character. Boom Eggman isn't tied to an end game. he doesn't really have a real goal. And therefore can be utilized in a lot more situations, where he's just goofing around or providing a different energy for Sonic. The moments of Eggman attacking with his robots aren't so much part of his conquests, but more a symbolic emphasis on the struggles the episode is about. 
For example, the episode Shay Amy, where Eggman joins Amy with a restaurant. This episode isn't so much about Sonic, Amy and Eggman running a restaurant, but more just general about stresses, worries and emotions any person, every restaurant owner can have, blown up to cartoon proportions. And Eggman's robot attack at the end of the episode seems more like a symbolic emphasis of a real fallout, the real stress and angry emotional response you can have when two different ideologies clash. And in the end, Amy's restaurant being destroyed in the aftermath of the robot attacks works perfectly as a metaphor of someone's desire and drive to run a business is being crushed after an emotional fallout with a previous partner they could have had. Sonic Boom is about us, it's about real human beings. And the Sonic the Hedgehog elements are just there as symbolic strength. Is the idea I'm getting, at least. Also consider jokes like the infamous You feed me ham, evil ham joke. Like, instead of evil being a judgement or end goal for Eggman, now it's more abstract, like a hobby or just a desire. A comical description to hang on onto even mundane actions. Eggman is not evil because of his actions or that his desires are problematic. Instead, evil is now just a comical abstract concept that Eggman enjoys. It makes it more relatable to us. We can replace evil with any kind of vice we personally enjoy. Eggman's joy in pursuit of the abstract concept of evil can easily be replaced with a smoker's desire for smoke or a fat guy's enjoyment of bad food. Now it feels more like a celebration of naughty behavior. Having a pride in who we are and what we enjoy, regardless if they are correct behavior. Therefore, Eggman pursuing evil works naturally in the series' logic. But whenever Eggman is giving a real pursuit, like creating an evil theme park, it's always treated like a joke. Eggman no longer works as a grounded villain who actually wants to achieve something. Now he's the abstract representation of temptation and the enjoyment of vices. This gives the jokes a surprising hidden layer of sophistication and complexity to them. And then there's Bob the Echidna. Well, okay, Knuckles. Knuckles isn't really written like a stupid character. He's more written like a comedian's imaginary friend coming to life. Okay, allow me to explain. While Knuckles is obviously meant to be stupid, but it always bothered me that he's so cheerful about it. Get it? Not at all! Ignorance is bliss, sure, but it's not so much that stupid people are happy about being stupid, more that the less you know, there's less for you to worry about and therefore you have less stress and therefore you're more confident. Stupid people are confident, not happy, but irrelevant. Okay, little personal story. A long time ago in high school, I had to do a class presentation. I always sucked at them, stage fright, it's terrifying, you're putting your soul naked onto the stage. So what I eventually figured out is that if I played a character, this, this crazy host with a weird voice, not only does that give me a lot more energy and bravery, but it also functions as a shield. Like, when I embarrass myself, it's not me who's embarrassed, it's, it's the clown I'm playing that's embarrassed. Heck, it might even be part of the show. Look at me, I'm the goofy clown. Whoops, I screwed up. I'm such a dumb idiot. Yay! Uh, this story isn't unique to me. This is how a lot of comedians really start. Comedians are often shy, insecure people, so they create some sort of mental Superman to their real Clark Kent that does all the brave and cool things they can never do in real life. And because this Superman, this mask, is often also made to be a shield for your insecurities, this Superman is often a deliberately failing or flawed goofball. It's all part of the show, people. As soon as I started to look at Knuckles as a cartoon manifestation of that attitude, he started to make a lot more sense to me. He always has the perfect misinterpretation and perfect character flaw during the right time, even or especially when it makes no sense for the character. So, of course, he suddenly can't talk in proper grammar when he usually does, or suddenly can't read, or whatever random stupidity is suddenly suffering that the rest of his appearances never really support. It's like the real Knuckles is insecure and hidden and instead blows himself up into this weird Superman who always makes a perfect clownish stumble to gain respect and energy from his peers that the real Knuckles would never have. And even if the writers themselves aren't aware of this, the way they utilize him does support this. Take episodes too good to be true, where stupid Knuckles meets a super competent Knuckles from a different dimension. If Knuckles was written like a true stupid character and the writers were interested in this, you'd think they have a lot of fun contrasting the two Knuckleses, making them team up and making Super Knuckles the complete opposite of stupid Knuckles. Instead, the two barely interact and competent Knuckles isn't all that smarter than say, Amy or Sonic, and definitely not stronger than Stupid Knuckles. Instead, the comedy mostly comes from the fact Smart Knuckles just talks in a weird voice. 
There will be time for your delicious burgers after we've defeated that dastardly deviant Eggman. In other words, this episode feels more like having the class clown Knuckles change his routine for a day than a true comedy about a character meeting his opposite. Knuckles is not written like he's stupid. He's written like a comedian acting like someone who's stupid. Instead of a mockery of the mentally poor, now he's a celebration of the class clown. Which is probably why a lot of people really like him. He brings in a lot of positive energy into the Sonic Boom universe. Now, this is a very interesting thing Sonic Boom is doing, even if it's only a side effect. Because, as we all know, Sonic fans can be very involved with the Sonic mythos and always wanted to be part of it. You know, all the recolors and fanfics and you name it. Hate it or love it, it's a huge part of fandom and the result of people consuming and, and wanting to be part of this universe. Sonic Boom now does this very clever thing that by removing the chains that tie Sonic and friends to a strong character foundation and instead make them more broad representations of human attitude, fans are more encouraged to be Sonic or Eggman. They are you. There's no more need to be Sonic's forgotten baddish twin brother or prince from a distant land. You can be Sonic yourself. He's a personality no longer anchored down in a strict and closed off story structure. This isn't only a Sonic Boom thing in fact. I'm starting to see this phenomenon a lot more in media. Especially Nintendo is starting to become a king of this. Where it's slowly but surely removing the fictional character buffer between game and player. As a player, you might have gotten involved in a sense of story context, an established hero, lore, world building, a twisting and turning conflict, and that catapulted you into the game. And that can be a problem, as we saw in some troubled Sonic games where the narrative ended up damaging the gameplay. Now, Nintendo is having this very interesting new marketing technique where they start to change that player, game brand, gameplay dynamic. Now, more and more, we see Nintendo itself suddenly taking the function the characters and lore used to have. Look at that Star Fox E3 video where it's all about the wonderful geniuses at Nintendo. Rest in peace, Sir Iwata. They reaffirm a connection between you and the creators, and then it goes straight to the game. No longer is it about Fox McCloud in a tense space battle where you take the controls, now it's about your buddies at Nintendo being fantastic and great, and here's the gameplay they want you to play. Disconnecting the importance of the narrative, the game retains a new purity where it's only the gameplay that matters and instead of a narrative luring the players in, now it's entirely the trust and respect you have for the creators to do that instead. Reggie and Miyamoto's association with quality gaming has essentially overtaken Fox McCloud's duty as the ambassador to draw players in. And now Fox and the others are merely just avatars, symbols with the sole purpose of tying this to the previous games. It's a very interesting twist and change in marketing and drawing players in. By removing heavy narrative, the connection between player and gameplay grows closer and retain a stronger sense of purity. This makes the new Metroid game so fascinating, where Nintendo is genuinely confused why people are bothered that the lore and main characters of Metroid are incorrect. Samus is irrelevant. The relevant thing is, Mimoto is wacky and crazy and a genius and the gameplay is great. Everything else is irrelevant, and A. Samus, if she would be in the game, should only be there as a representative of the early games rather than an actual character to care for. But this Metroid game doesn't need that, it has great gameplay, and therefore it doesn't need Samus. Besides that, this is a great way to slowly fight and dismantle this notion of grown man playing children games by connecting players and the game closer and making the video game characters more and more into merely vessels for us to insert ourselves in rather than established characters in a true narrative, our brains are allowed more and more to insert more elements and values of our own life into the game world and therefore draw us closer. This is no longer a children's game, this is literally your game. It's you, it's becoming a mirror. Like an empty room you're invited to live in. The room is made by the developers, but eventually it's your furniture and your clothing that's messing up the place. So. Is this what Sonic Boom is now doing? Might possibly be. That Sonic Boom is becoming a mirror for us to stare in. And that makes it fascinating. And not to mention as a bonus, Sonic fans who feel more guilty about enjoying this series or who suffer extreme anxieties and are emotionally unstable, I mean Sonic fans do get a lot of abuse aimed at them, they might find Sonic Boom's self-deprecating humor and celebration of incompetency very cathartic. It's a very clever perspective they're going with. Or... I'm just insane, you never know. But hey, it's a possible way to look at Sonic Boom. So yeah, weird stuff, but that's what happens when you start dissecting. What do you people see? Let me know in the comments. Until next time, folks. Bye-bye.